Week number five of barley, first fruits, and the rapture. We've studied the spring holidays of Passover, first fruits, unleavened bread, Pentecost. We've looked at the significance of barley in every one of these, and the place of flax and linen. We've looked at the Holy Spirit being given to us as an earnest and as a pledge of the resurrection to come. He is the down payment. He is the earnest money for the fact that we will be resurrected just as the first fruits of barley was the promise of a harvest. We saw the value of barley is 90 shekels is the cost of a man in barley. Omers of barley. You could pay for a death in the Old Testament with omers of barley. It was holy unto the Lord. And in Hosea, it cost him 90 shekels to buy a harlot and to purchase her in her sin. We saw later the value of man himself is 90 shekels. A woman is 53 shekels. And a woman of ill repute was equal in God's eyes to the price of the man. In other words, we're even when it comes to the redeeming price. No one is worth more. No one is worth less. We are all the same. We saw barley in the Bible demonstrated through Gideon and the barley cakes when they overtook the army and had the clay pots and put their torches in the clay pots so that they simmered and they glowed but could not flame because of a lack of oxygen. And before they fell upon the army, they smashed the pots and the flames flew out. A picture of the earthen vessels that we have that we will shed in the rapture and we will all be as he is. We saw a foreshadowing of the rapture in the three companies and the barley loaves of Gideon. We saw Jesus in his first miracle, that six pots of purification water was equal to 90 shekels, the price of a human being. The first miracle of Jesus, Cana of Galilee, turning water into wine, that water pots were turned into 90 shekels of wine. The price of a man. The value of a human being. Even his first miracle was proclaiming his redemption. We saw Elisha and barley. That the barley was thrown into the poison soup. And all of them got well after they'd been poisoned by what they put in the soup. Because of the addition of barley. It is the condition of every man that we are all poisoned by the devil, poisoned by our sin, poisoned by our actions. And yet by adding the holiness of the Holy Spirit, which barley represents, we can be saved. We saw there was no wheat. The stew was full of death. Throwing the meal in was life. Very equal to Jesus feeding the 4,000, we said today. That's what you missed so far and a whole lot more, okay? Yeah. But it gets you kind of up to date with what we're talking about. Let's talk about Jesus and the barley cakes. You want to? John 6. John 6 verse 1 will begin. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. This was not Passover, but it's around the corner. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Remember, God ain't never surprised by your problems. Amen. God's never surprised by your circumstances. You understand that before you get in a pickle jar, He already knows you're going to be in the pickle jar and how to get you out of it. Yes, sir. Yes. 
He was saying this to test him, for he himself knew that he was intending to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for even everyone to receive just a crumb. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves, Holy Spirit, promise, the coming one, who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Lord, we got three McFish sandwiches out here. Okay, what are you, you going to do with 4,000 people? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, and number about 5,000. They took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. When the Holy Spirit comes, he doesn't want anybody to be left behind. You see, because some of you are going to die. And you're already going to be in glory. But for those of us who are alive and left behind, we're going to be the crumbs that are being picked up on the way. Do you get it? you get the picture? Yes, there are those who are asleep, but for those of us who remain and who are alive, we will be gathered up into Him, we're told. A picture of the gathering of the leftovers. Ain't nobody going to be left behind. It says, So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments. Twelve. <coughs> the apostles. Perfection. The church. So there are twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore... When the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. You see, barley and the Holy Spirit is being retold on that hillside, on that grassy plain where there was much grass to sit in. And I've shown you pictures of the, the uh, Capernaum plain there, how grassy it is and how farmland it is and how beautiful it is and how easy it is to farm. I mean, everything else is rocks and hills, and you got this flat area of where it used to be the sea and has receded, and now is farmland. Beautiful. They're sitting there, and by coincidence, just by coincidence, my goodness, who would have ever thunked it? What a coincidence that there's a little boy who has barley loaves. No coincidences in the Bible, are there? You see, what was celebrated in Elisha is being celebrated in Galilee. And so when they saw this, everybody knew the story of Elisha. And they went, this is the prophet who has now come in to the world. Yes, sir. Folks, we looked at the book of Exodus and saw the role of barley and rapture. We looked at the spring holy days, and we saw the significance of barley and the coming rapture. We looked at Gideon and his picture of the rapture and the resurrection. We've looked at Elisha and the pouring of the grain, and then later the barley loaves being brought and feeding the prophets with leftovers. And then we've seen Cana of Galilee, that it's equal to the cost of a man in barley. We have seen the feeding of the 4,000 and the place of barley and the coming king. I want to remind you that the value of barley is an omer of barley, 50 shekels. And that if we value the measure of a man... A man is worth 90 shekels, the female worth 53, and the slave is worth 30. Hosea speaks of 90 shekels, and he bought her on the third day. Cana was 90 shekels, and it happened on the third day. We saw God redeeming his people 
to first fruits. And the first fruits is three days. Jesus redeems his people in the third day of the first fruits and Easter, the resurrection. All having to do with the barley harvest of first fruits. Wheat comes 50 days later, called Pentecost. Well, who taught us about the rapture? I mean, we're talking about the rapture like we know about the rapture. We're talking about the rapture like we've studied the rapture, like we, we believe this is the thing. We're just using the word like it's a dime a dozen word. But what do we really know about the rapture, and who taught us about the rapture? Who taught us? Somebody. No, 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 no. Paul. Paul taught us about the rapture. <coughs> Turn to First Thess Thessalonians one. I mean, how come we're believing this Paul guy? First Thessalonians one ten says, "And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come." We're to wait. Jesus is coming back. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 is one of the first times that the entire scripture says, specifically without any type of a shadow, that we got to wait because he's coming back. We'll look at 2.19. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? He's telling the Thessalonians, he's coming again. Get ready for it. Yes, Are you ready? He is going to come again. Look at 3.13. And so that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Now we got a new picture. We got saints coming with us. Holy mackerel, where did Paul get all this stuff for Pete's sake? Jesus didn't say this in the Gospels. Now Thessalonians is one of the first books that he wrote. So it's not old, it's a, I mean it's not something that came around when he was an old man. This is at the beginning of his ministry. He's telling people, he's coming again, he's coming again, he's coming again. How many of you ever heard of Paul Revere? Yeah, yeah. what do you say? The British are coming, the British are coming, the British are coming, right? He was the forerunner of that. Paul is the forerunner of this whole new teaching that he's coming again. Now, does the Old Testament teach about the return? Of, of course it does. We've looked at it. Do the Gospels allude to it and teach about it? Of course they do. We've looked at that. But nowhere have we seen a specific word to the church under the new covenant that says, hey, it is going to happen. The promise will be fulfilled until we get here. Paul is saying, you know what you studied and read? Yeah. Well, here's what it means. He's coming again. He told you when he went up that he was going to come back in like fashion. I want to remind you, he's going to do it, Paul says. I'm reminding you, it's going to happen. Look at 4.14. This book is literally an opening, revealing, ex showing us step by step what's going to happen. We've gone from his promise to his coming to his saints are coming too. 4.14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Gideon, blow the trumpet and smash the pots. 3,000 men with a trumpet to their lips. And a torch and a clay pot on top of it. Now some of us were laughing the other day. Where'd the third hand come from? I got a... <laughs> come on. I got a trumpet. I got my clay pot. And I got my torch. Who's going to break the pot? Um, uh... Uh... Well, I prayed about it and I got an answer. 
the area that they're in has big boulders and rocks, and they just kind of went smash. You see, doo -doo -doo -doo, I got no hand to smash the pot. Doo -doo -doo -doo, I got no hand to smash the pot. Doo -doo -doo -doo. There, I broke it. <laughs> the place is littered with boulders all up and down the valley. It's littered with boulders. For the Lord himself will, descend, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. Go to the next chapter, 5, 9, and 10. Do you see how Thessalonians is opening the book a little wider and a little wider and a little wider and revealing to us step by step by step rather than dumping it all at one time and going, what? Well, that's too much. He is revealing to us. 9 says... For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through, Lord, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or whether we are crumbs being picked up afterwards, the remnants being picked up, whether we're awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you also are doing. You see, Paul is the one who comes along and gives us the theology of the rapture, who gives us the details of the rapture, who tells us the step-by-step -step progression of the rapture. Where did Paul get it? Go to Galatians 1. Galatians 1.15 says, But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately run to Christians and say, What do I need to know? I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Nor did I run up to Jerusalem to those who were the apostles before me. But instead, I went to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Paul. went first to Arabia. Mount Sinai, the giving of the law, where the law was written in stone, the holy mountain that God had chosen. And Mount Sinai is the seat of all we know about the moral, loving God. Think about it. Everything that the world knows, K-N-O-W-S, knows about the moral, living God started in Arabia on a mountain. Hmm. Passover, Egypt. Crossing the Red Sea first fruits Mount Sinai Pentecost the three spring festivals represented and this is our Pentecost this is our pledge this is our earnest that there will be a resurrection. He went to Arabia and spent time being taught by the Lord. I did not consult flesh and blood, but I was prepared to become the missionary 
to the Gentiles. Guess what? We already saw in the Old Testament that the Messiah will return. We already saw in the Gospels that the Messiah will return. But did the Gentiles know come here from Sikkim about the Messiah returning? No. And the city of Thessalonica is where he wrote this letter to. And they are the ones who are Gnostics and said, when we die, we become dust. There is no afterlife. And Paul wrote to them first and said, oh yes, there is. Oh yes, there is. And I learned it from the Master's voice. Now, Paul could not call himself an apostle unless he had been with the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the criteria for an apostle. He was with him in the desert. And the Lord said, Oh, there's so much more. So much more. And so the Holy Spirit was his teacher. And he came back with the word. Giving of the law, Exodus 19, 5 to 20. Exodus 19, 5. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my possession among all the peoples, for the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. Lord said to Moses, that'll be the day. No, he didn't either. He said, behold, <laughs> aren't you glad he didn't say it? Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and you may also believe in you forever. They will believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments. Let them be ready for the what? Let them be ready for the third day. On the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely die and be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn... When the ram's horn, the blowing of the trumpet, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. He said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Don't even go near a woman. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there was thunder and lightning flashes, thick cloud upon the mountain, very loud trumpet sounds, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. Whoo, doggies. So Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of the furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. Exodus 9, he has a peculiar treasure in his people. 9.6 says, he called them a kingdom of priests. 9.7, he called the elders before the Lord. 9.9, 9, God came in a cloud. When they see the cloud, they will hear me. 1910, sanctified the garments. They had to put on the clean clothes. God came on the third day. He came with lightning. There was a sound of a trumpet. There was a voice of God was heard. God descended and Moses ascended. 
Now, we don't have time to look up every one of these verses, but I will publish it on Facebook for you this week, the rest of the story. But let's walk through it. Are you ready? If we look, the return of Jesus. 1 Peter 2.9 tells us we are a peculiar people. Revelation 5.10 calls us kings and priests of the Lord. Revelation 4.10 says there are 24 elders in heaven and we are a part of that assemblage. Revelation 1.7 tells us he returns in the clouds. Revelation 16.15 tells us we will be clean garmented. We will be white as snow. Hosea 6 told us that all of this is raised up on the third day. Jesus will be raised up on the third day, and he was. Matthew 24 tells us he will return as lightning. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, we read, there's going to be the sound of the trumpet of God when it happens. There will be the voice of the archangel. The voice of God was heard. The trumpet was heard. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 tells us God descends and we ascend. Do you see why Paul went to Mount Sinai to get instruction? It's where God met to tell his promise. Now, I don't think Paul just got on a donkey and said, let's go look for Jesus. Do you? I think he was led and instructed by the Holy Spirit to go to Sinai. But there, other scriptures say that he spent as much as three years in the desert learning of the Lord. He waited a long time to come back and start his ministry. Three years. Three years. It's almost like going to seminary. Or cemetery. But anyway, getting your <laughs> cemetery degree. Do you see the giving of the law and the return of jo Jesus? The rapture. The third day. The importance of the Holy Spirit. And barley is in the middle of it all. Barley, first fruits, and rapture. Let's stand together.